I'm being joined tonight by a senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Afam Osigwe. He's in Abuja. So thank you so much, senior advocate, for joining us tonight. And let's begin by uh, getting to know, first and foremost, what happened in uh, Sunday Igbo's uh, residence uh, relating to the raid by the DSS. Under the law, what is your assessment of the operation of the DSS at his residence in Ibadan? of the explanation by the DSS is that the, the raid um, gives room for doubts as to whether it was necessary or as to whether the DSS did not use excessive force. Now, if they got intelligence, how did they introduce themselves upon arrival? What were the rules of engagement employed by the DSSs? And the way we talk about two persons gone down, ten persons gone down in Nigeria, beginning to look as if life means nothing. And it's continually, it has become a pattern that whenever security operatives go, go on such missions, many more persons are killed than are arrested. Where this one, only two persons were killed, but they are human beings. And we need to review the rules of engagement. And it's time we start, started advocating that operatives who embark on such missions wear body cams so that we'll be able to have a view of the recordings of these their body cams to so actually know whether some of the, the stories they tell actually co uh, correlate with the facts or the reality. Now, when you talk about getting intelligence that a person is stockpiling arms and the much that the DSSS could show were seven guns, one would have thought there was a whole lot of an armory in that home. That is not to say that possession of arms in the premises, if indeed the arms were there, is justifiable. But just to say that sometimes the Nigerian security agencies adopt a sledgehammer approach towards dealing with security challenges. And we don't seem to have learned much from history. We do not seem to have learned that the Boko Haram situation in, in Borno State started because the security agencies felt that it was a very good way of stopping Boko Haram was by killing Mohammed Yusuf, the leader. And now we seem to be headed in that same direction in handling the Sunday Boko situation in the Southwest. And I think the earlier the government rethinks its strategy and tries to find out the root causes where there are so many agitations by different groups or persons for a separate entity, the earlier we're able to address these challenges, the better for us. Adopting a, 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 um, a jackboot approach to addressing these issues will not achieve anything. The earlier the government engage with these persons and not thinking that shooting people, raiding people's homes at night without people even knowing that whether the people knocking on their doors are criminals or anything, the earlier we rethink that strategy, the better for us. But I do not think that I find the, the, the operation by the DSSS is satisfactory in this circumstance. I think there's excessive use of force, and I think the, the security agencies may not have adopted the best internationally accept, accepted standard in reading that home at that time of the night and in their engagement with the occupants of the premises at that time of the day. You will help us make sense, legally speaking, of force of uh, some of these issues, and perhaps my audience tonight will be able to get a sense of what happened and what the law says. So, um, let's get it clearly. Does the DSS require a warrant to search or to carry that kind of operation uh, on Sunday Igbo's house under the law? They do. They do. They need to apply to a magistrate or to some superior police officer to, and, and there should be an affidavit stating the grounds for their belief that there is need to search that. And they execute that search warrant by informing the occupants of the house, showing them the search warrant, which will be the authority to enter upon their premises. In all the releases I have heard or read about, there has not been made any mention made of any such authorization being obtained before the premises was searched. It would have been a different thing if, for example, the DSSS were stationed around his home or were passing by his home and they opened fire on them and there was need for them to re engage them. But people were sleeping in the dead of night and the DSSS arrived. No indication as to whether anybody introduced themselves. No indication as if anybody knew those who went to that premise. No indication that they were informed of the, about the mission of the, of the persons who came to the premises. All we heard that there was continued exchange of gunfire for about one hour before they now entered there. And the, 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 the uh, nature of casualties sustained by injury by the DS is also points to question whether some of these stories are actually um, uh, uh, credible. He said only one of the operatives sustained a gunshot wound to the hand. And yet there was sustained gunshot for one hour and two persons lay dead at the end of it. 
we need to actually have a review of such operations after they must have taken place. We need to insist that persons embarking on these operations wear body cam, like I said earlier. That is now the internationally accepted practice, especially while there has been loss of life. We need to also know whether the situation warrants the, excess, the kind of force used in this circumstance, and whether this is also not an attempt, whether there is no correlation between this raid on that home and the planned rally in Lagos. We need to look at these two things, so, or many um, other things, rather. Great, uh, because one of the things that you said about wearing body cams, because there are laid down procedure, uh, we've had this kind of conversations before when the DSS has explained that, especially because when it involves uh, evidence being found in, in the process of a search and how, what they find and all of that, and evidence that these things are not planted and were found there, and I know DSS might be able to explain that, but in the scenario which played out and which you have explained, what if it happens, maybe if it happens, the DSS says that they got an intelligence that there is a stockpile of arms. Could there be any premise under the law that gives the DSS an operational uh, opportunity to do what it did without uh, acquiring or requiring or going there without a warrant? They said they got intelligence that their arm, arms were being stockpiled. If indeed they did that, and let's take for a moment, we don't doubt that they do. Before you storm such premises, you give the occupants an opportunity to surrender. You tell them your mission and give them opportunity to surrender and allow you access into that. I have not heard that any of these things, any of these things was done. If I take you back to the U.S., there was a time uh, one David Koresh of the Davidian court that the, the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and um, uh, firearms, ATF, had to storm there. They waited, there was a siege for 53 days before they went into there. It's only in Nigeria you get intelligence, the next thing you go rampaging through that place like a bull in a china shop. And people are dead at the end of the day and questions are not asked. And stories are told against the dead that nobody is able to ask questions about. And bodies are displayed as, as if there is no dignity for either the living or the dead. I'm not saying the DSS as if they have credible intelligence should not act on it. But my point is, there must be due process of law. We must do things in a civil way that ensures that we were able to gather enough evidence to show justification for the operation. And also giving those who are in that premise an opportunity either to give up or for there to be minimal loss of lives or minimal use of force. And I don't think that has been done in this circumstance. The, the other side of the conversation tonight is also about uh, the rally, the rights to protest, and what the police is saying in Lagos. Uh, the, the, the question now is that those kind of firearms that we saw displayed by the DSS, could there be any possibility under the law that these are acquired legally? Those kind of uh, range of firearms based on the Firearms Act. Well, I do not think the Firearms Act permits individuals to carry such arms. Uh, if for you to carry such arms, you need the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the approval from the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I would like to believe that that may not have been given at this instance for points of argument. Now, the issue is that there are a lot of arms. There's a proliferation of small arms in circulation in Nigeria. The, poor, the nature of a porous border, there's so many wars going on in many parts of Africa make it easy for people to acquire these arms and transport them across transnational borders. But the point is, if there's intelligence that these things were actually in that house, there should have been better ways of getting them, and there should have also been better ways of dealing with this situation. And talking about the right to protest, it is a fundamental right of persons to protest. And unfortunately, in recent times in Nigeria, we have seen situations where people apparently are sponsored to disrupt peaceful demonstrations and turn them violent, thereby giving justification for security agencies to now clamp down on the protesters. We must find a balance. And the police must learn that when, and the security agencies must learn that when people plan to do a peaceful protest, especially an organization that has carried out peaceful protests in some times past without any resort to violence, the police should be there to protect them, to provide security for them, and not to disrupt them or stop them it would appear that the aim in Lagos is to stop the entire demonstration. Now, if the police got intelligence that people are trying to cause violence, one would expect the police 
to target those trying to disrupt the planned peaceful protest and not to stop the peaceful protest itself. If they got intelligence, that intelligence should give them an idea of those who are planning them, how they intend to operate, and give them adequate information to prepare to stop those who intend to make the demonstration violent from achieving their aim. But like because I said, an, an, the an argument will be a demonstration, so that's clear. Yeah, an argument will be uh, that considering the history of what happened the last year during the NSAS protests and police officers being killed and the police uh, formations uh, being touched and uh, things that happened. But uh, uh, we've since been joined on the program of also from our Abuja studio there, a retired Deputy Inspector General of Police, Abila Joshak. He was, uh, before his retirement, uh, the DIG in charge of operations. It's good to see you again, DIG, and thank you so much for joining us. Before I get you into the conversation about the rally in Lagos, because I know during your time, um, issues of protest also is a major issue. The issues of whether you have water cannons and uh, um, uh, tear gas to be able to manage protests when it gets out of hand. But for the, uh, uh, the raid that happened in Sunday Igbo, house in a bathroom. What is the operational procedure for carrying out that kind of raid by the DSS? Is a sister agency that you worked with when you were uh, in service. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, the, the action taken by any security operative or whoever that has been assigned you know, to, to tackle a challenge depends on the gravity of such a complaint. Uh, if um, what has been reported and what is about to happen is so magnanimous that um, uh, the magnitude that will disturb the peace of the state or some other citizens will really be hurt, then um, the security agencies have the right to break in and break out to ensure that they contain the danger element, either human beings or materials or arms, uh, they have the right to, to, to quickly go and break in and break out and ensure that um, the situation is, 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 is being tackled and contained in order not to have the citizen harmed. Is there any premise at all under the law operationally that allows security agencies to take uh, action, to take that kind of operation without a warrant? I mean, does an emergency situation gives the any security agency any premise to do that kind of, carry out that kind of operation? It does, it does. There, there is a provision or um, policy or some um, processes that allow the security agencies to ensure that if, the, if there's any element, like I said, a human, whether human or um, arms or whatever, that is likely uh, to disturb the peace of the nation and create problem or lead to death and what have you. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is allowed that that be contained with. And that means that you don't need to go, that you want to go and take um, a search warrant or warrant of arrest before you come and tackle that situation. You contend with that situation, and, um, and, and, and thereafter, you saw that. But, 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 but the security agencies and other security around, or even um, civilians that have the opportunity uh, to ensure that they contain or they, they, they prevent that happening, it's allowed. Okay, let's take a breather. But when we come back after the break, We'll be looking at what is going to happen in Lagos tomorrow. The police have said, no, we don't want any rally to happen because of the possibility of violence in Lagos based on what has happened before. But the pro Yoruba Nation group has said, they will go on. They've pre-informed the police, written to the governor. But how will this play out? The experts here on the program tonight will give us more insight to this. Plus, we dissect the PIB again with one of my guests in Maduguri Studio. Don't go anywhere. We have so much more to talk about. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Lagos residents are thinking about what could happen tomorrow. 
the police are saying, look, we got everything covered for you uh, as much as you don't go out uh, for these pro Yoruba nation protests by the group called the Ilano Omo Udua, and uh, a group that uh, Sunday, I think I'm popularly called Sunday, we will also belong to, don't forget that, uh, only uh, yesterday, that his house was raided by the DSS, and a lot of explanation is being made on what happened and what did not happen. So tonight we're giving you the legal and the security perspectives to this matter. I've got some very experienced experts in this area. A senior advocate of Nigeria, Afa Mosigwe, in our Abuja studio, and a retired Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of operations why was in service, Habila Joshak. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, for your time tonight. Let me get back to Mr. Joshak on this matter. Uh, it's actually very interesting when you said security agencies can actually go uh, without a warrant um, into any facility in Nigeria, be it home, be it anywhere. Is that in line uh, with your operational procedure? or under the constitution, that that is covered? Well, um, don't get me wrong. Um, I said it depends on the gravity of the information that has been converted into intelligence, and it also uh, depends on the assessment of the situation. If there's a situation that can consume a lot of lives and destruction of properties, and you now want to wait to go get some, um, uh, uh, some warrant to execute, then it would have been too late. And so, in practice, you, ca you, you have to first of all contain with that monster by preventing it to happen. And therefore, you, you, you don't have an excuse to say you cannot prevent an incident from happening as a security agency, or even um, a member, a, a citizen, and that um, the reasons are that you need a warrant uh, to go execute. And that's why I'm saying in emergencies and when there are threat to lives and when it has been assessed that such um, action, if allowed to go on, that there are going to be a lot of loss, other humans and material, then you have to contend with that. All right, so in my producer and from the control room, they could give us a split screen of uh, the Sunday Igbo's resident as uh, after the aftermath of that raid. Uh, I'd like uh, uh, Mr. Joshua Kabila to give us a sense of what could have happened. Uh, uh, from your operational experience, two people were said to have been killed in that process. The, the DSS said there was a gun battle. What do you imagine could have gone wrong that perhaps had led to the death of this man, a DSS operative was also injured in the process. Well, um, yeah, to insinuate and to, uh, to to assume would be very, very difficult. But I, I should think that um, if if it is it is to prevent anything from happening, and if it's a a, a, a dwelling house like this, and uh, we're seeing this kind of a thing, it is either that um, uh, more above maximum force was used, which is wrong or that um, there were resistance, and so there were exchange of um, either um, shooting or attempting to effect arrest. And so I, I think that um, investigation will reveal it is possible that if there are maximum forces that are used beyond the expectation in order to quell a small thing using a sledgehammer uh, to kill a, a, a mosquito, uh, then the law will take its course. But from what I've seen, it is either there were some resistance or it is that um, maximum force was used as against minimum force. That, that is a, a, a picture of what, what I can see. If you can spend the next 60 seconds and walk us through the operational procedure, if you are to lead your men, for example, uh, as you mean when you are in service, walk us through how you engage when you are going for this kind of operation in a residential facility. Well, like I said, it depends on exactly what the intelligence or the information were. Um, it would be wrong for us to assume that um, there were excess use of force and threat to even the lives of those that are right in there. And at the same time, whether there were resistance and the reason for entering there, maybe there were arms 
and that the arms uh, could be taken out, and that um, oh, there was some struggling. And like I said, it's, it's not fair for now to speculate uh, uh, and, to, uh, and, and to say this is this. But um, investigation will, will show exactly. It will, it, will, it will bring out who is wrong. Because those who came in there, if they went in with the maximum force, then they will account for that. But if there were resistance that have led to a lot of things that I'm seeing, bottles out and, and down, the law will also take its course. Uh, so I, would, I wanted to ask, I mean, because sometimes you see some of these scenarios play out, I, I, I probably don't expect that the DSS would have gone knocking on the door to say, okay, uh, open your door, we just wanted to come and check whether you have uh, arms stockpiled or not. I probably would have imagined that if they want to get those uh, evidence, they probably would have knocked the door down and enter because of what they said they have in their intelligence. But uh, that's just left to imagination, like you said. But if you go into what is happening in Lagos, um, the police have said, do not go on the rally. But based on what uh, the group has said, the lawyer has written, has written to the police and to the governor, and they said that they have informed them of the rally and they need to be protected. What do you think could happen in this sense? The police said, do not protest. The protesters have said, we were, we were going to come out a rally. We are protected under the law. Well, there, there is a communication gap. I should think that um, if the police or any security agencies are saying that no, this can happen, then there must be a meeting point. I think also those who want to do that should be able to be patient enough uh, to to also cross cross fertilize ideas to to, to make sure that. Um, um, the police or the security agencies that are preventing them from coming out uh, to exercise their rights should be able to convince them why they shouldn't go out. But if they are apart and um, those who want to go on protest are saying we have that right constitutionally and we have to go out, they should be able to also listen to uh, the security agencies who are saying this is why you shouldn't go out. And then there would be a meeting point. And right out there, if there is a disagreement, then we can now understand that each side wants to stand its own. But if there has been no communication and this has not been discussed, then it's quite bad. But the security or the security agencies have the responsibility of securing safety of people and the properties. And if they are saying something, I also think that the citizens should listen to them. If it does not make sense, that is when they can also say and go ahead to do what they want to do. Um, there is uh, a footage that we were playing earlier. Uh, it, lo it does look like uh, an anti-riot truck, uh, like a water cannon truck that we saw. That's the police chief in Lagos. Uh, that's the truck there. Um, if police are saying we do not want, then one could imagine that as soon as they see protesters tomorrow, there might be discharge of water cannon or um, uh, tear gas. Could that be the case tomorrow, Mr. Joshak? Yeah, I, I could see that the, um, the, those um, security agencies are trying to be very civil, and I think the, the also has um, the, the handbook for, um, trying for, 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 for um, securing a crowd, crowd control, uh, because the water cannon, it's... Um, it's the water that is heated, and of course, maybe with coloration, to be able to, uh, uh, to press that on the people, and then um, maybe irritants, and also to let them also, uh, once it falls on your, your dress, they will be able to know that you were there, and then you'll be arrested. It's, it's, very, it's very, very harmless. And if that is what they are demonstrating, then it, it means that um, they are going to be very civil, and they are going to ensure that those who disobey the law should 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 be able to, to uh, they should be able to get them, but not to harm, and not to injure, and not to destroy. If that is that that water cannon that I've seen. So let me go back to uh, uh, State Advocate uh, Alpha Mosigwe. Um, so that is in Nigerian law, the, the the Constitution spells it out that the nation uh, is indivisible. Um, that means that. 
the, uh, the, uh, the conversation and the issue of self, uh, self-determination, I'm not very sure that is captured in our constitution, but it's also, I'm very certain that it's captured in, uh, in some international um, uh, um, uh, codes that guarantee the rights of people. Um, it does look like the, what some of these groups are asking for is in line with self-determination, uh, the secessionists in some sense. How do you manage that? What does the law say about this kind of scenario under the present situation we have on our hands in Nigeria? Now, um, thanks, Shingo. There's a difference between um, people agitating for a right to self-determination, to being able to have some autonomy or, or independence from a nation. The Scots have been on the, right, on the battle for independence from the, from the United Kingdom. And so they have some degree of autonomy within the union. And some persons in Nigeria are asking for self-determination, and many persons are not in agreement as to what the meaning of this is. So some call it through federalism. Some also speak about secession. But I think all these, whatever way they are carried out, are rights, universally recognized rights. But there's also a difference between agitating for self-determination and insurrection. That is where people take up arms to try to achieve that. I do not think we have got to that point. I said earlier that the government should be worried that these cries are gaining momentum and transcending more than one region. And the government should not, as was done by the president some days ago or some weeks ago, say that there is no going to be any restructuring. In other words, shutting out any possibility of any conversation. The government must realize that when there's a lot of discontentment in the policy, in the polity, the best way to address it is not by saying, if you try it, we'll crush you. The best way to address it is not by wishing it away and saying that is not a subject for discussion. The government must sit down with the component units. The Swiss, as a, the, the Switzerland as a nation has survived because they have some form of confederation that allows the cantons or the federating units some degree of autonomy. The people feel that there's a lot of power given to the center in Nigeria and that e power is ceded more to the states or to the regions that some of these issues will be addressed. These are things that call for people to sit down at the table and talk. Even though you have not asked me this question, but I think I should because it is somewhat related to it. The right of people to the protection and privacy of their home is guaranteed by the Constitution. It cannot be violated without due process of law. And where people want to demonstrate in, in furtherance of their quest for self-determination and where they have not been shown to be armed or violent or trying to topple the government, or trying to unleash mayhem or lead to breakdown of law and order. Their right must be respect respected. If police has credible information or intelligence, as they say, that there is plan for some other group to foment violence, I think the best thing the police would have done, which is what I think the, the retired DIG meant by when he said there's communication gap, is to sit down with the organizers of the rally and show them some prima facie proof that there's such a plan afoot and work out with them a way of organizing this demonstration as to minimize breakdown of law and violence or attack by these other persons. Or alternatively, convincing them with overwhelming evidence as to the danger in going ahead. But when the police first does show of force, which seems to be targeted at all demonstrators, whether peaceful or allegedly planning to be violent, and make statements which is prohibitive, emasculating the right of protest of individuals, it makes it doubtful as whether that intelligence is not a convenient excuse to prevent a demonstration. But I think above all, we are getting to the point where unless we want to keep deceiving ourselves, if we don't handle these situations well, it will snowball and get out of hand. The government of the day must reassess its policy and its position on some of these issues. And whatever it takes to discuss these issues and address them, the government must be humble enough to do that. Otherwise, we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder. So let me ask uh, Mr. Joshak, because uh, the police says that, look, there are elements that are possible uh, to foment trouble. How do you, in this kind of scenario, this rally protest kind of scenario, how do you isolate these hoodlums, these elements that are destructive from the, the, uh, the Nigerians who are planning a peaceful rally? Um, that is the point, and that is the line to be drawn. 
it's quite um, very, very difficult for very, very law-abiding citizen who wants to come in and exercise their, front, their rights of protesting against a system, against a decision, against something that is up, uh, to say this is not in our interest. Uh, usually when those people with very good reason and convincing reason in the interest of, of, of the citizen and the country, you find out that suddenly this, 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 this is hijacked. And so I, I, I think that um, there should be a meeting point between the security agencies and those organizers of the rally to be able to understand themselves and to be able to cross-fertilize ideas and um, in order to save the lives of those of them who might not be part and get caught in, in, in that kind of um, situation. And so I, I think that, um, yes, uh, the citizens have the right to protest. The Constitution guarantees uh, people's movement and people's um, voicing out. And um, that also has to be taken into consideration. And the security agencies should wait and ensure that they penetrate the organizers and get to a point where there is an agreement. Otherwise, um, the grass will suffer. All right, let's close this segment of the conversation. And I would like us to do it in 30 seconds. I would like to put both of you on the spot. If you were in Lagos, uh, and you're supposed to be part of this protest, would you go out tomorrow considering uh, this sort of disagreement and the gap in the communication? Let me begin with Mr. Osigwe. Would you go out tomorrow with this kind of gap if you were to, uh, to be part of this protest? Would you? If I was in Lagos and part of this protest, I would go out tomorrow. But I would be wary that there may be a plan to sponsor people to disrupt it. Uh, Mr. Joshak, I mean, you have a security background. Uh, would, you, would you go out? Uh, because you, you've explained that there is a gap in communication. Yeah, there's a gap in communication. And, um, of course, uh, people must go out uh, to, to do whatever assignment they have. And... Um, People should, should, should go out, and, but, but, but the security agencies should also be very careful to protect the lives of those of them that uh, All right. want to go do what they think is um, it's important. Mr. Abela Joshak, uh, former DIG of police, thank you so much for your time tonight. And Mr. Afam Osigwe, senior advocate of Nigeria, thank you indeed. It's a pleasure uh, getting these expert opinions from both of you. Thank you indeed. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.